So thank you all for coming for um, our second provider presentation um, here at Bhakti Wellness. And I'm going to take some time today and just kind of do a, just kind of a, a biography, just a little bit about my background, who I am, and, and a, a little bit about my practice. And um, in future presentation, we'll go into more detail on uh, exactly the kind of work that I do and, and uh, how that goes in the clinic. So I've been practicing for 20 years. Um, uh, I have over 4,000 hours of education. And what kind of makes me giggle about this is back when I was deciding on what career I wanted to do, I was, uh, everybody thought I would go into computer science because I had been doing it for years. I was already writing software. Um, and it was just presumed that that's what I would do. But um, I felt like I would be in school forever if I went that way, because I could already tell technology was changing so fast that it was going to be a constant learning curve. And so I said, I don't want to do that. I want to do something where I can just kind of learn it and then do my job. And, uh, and 20 years later, I've been in school pretty much continuously since I started. And I, I guess, I don't know, maybe I should have picked computers. It might have been more lucrative, but uh, probably not nearly as enjoyable as, as what I'm doing now. Um, so along the way, I've spent six years teaching. Um, I worked eight years at University of Minnesota, where I was uh, hired to, uh, as a consultant, to uh, uh, put together an integrative clinic for them. And then after doing that, they offered me the job of, of running the clinic that I had set up. And it, it seemed like a, a pretty good clinic, so I said yes. Um, I spent eight years there doing that. We were the first um, college integrative uh, clinic. And uh, to, as far as I know, we're, the University of Minnesota's Boynton Health Services is still the only college healthcare integrative clinic uh, that's up and running. Um, I left there uh, with the idea of taking the model that I had created with the university and bring it out into kind of the private market, asking the question of, could we do the same thing? We were successful within the academic setting, but could we be in the, uh, you know, in the private market? Uh, so that led me to found uh, Bhakti Wellness Center, and as a part of that, then came actually the Bhakti Meditation Center, and then the Wake Up Call radio show, which is a, a weekly radio show that that uh, I and uh, four other hosts put on. So I have actually uh, over 40 different certifications. Now most of those are just certifications of completion, right? So I took a course. It doesn't mean that I'm certified to practice in that modality, um, but there are uh, foundational trainings in, in over 40 different um, styles. But there are kind of 10 main styles that I would say I would use on a, you know, any clinical day, I would use some of these, you know, that range from just basic relaxation massage to some more technical, um, you know, sports massage, working with an athlete in training, how to, how to apply that. I did a, a couple years training in traditional Chinese medicine practiced actively as that for a number of years, um, but decided I liked massage better and kind of went back to that, which eventually uh, evolved into cranial sacral. So I have that in the background, but I don't uh, practice explicitly um, shiatsu anymore. Um, my knees can't take it, basically. Um, so the, the two main things that I do on any given day in the clinic are massage and cranial sacral therapy. And I kind of tend to keep the two uh, very separate. Um, just my own sense of how they work in the body and that, that they, each one goes better if they're not blended into one session. But in the massage world, I tend to do more rehabilitation work than, <coughs> than just general massage. But I also will see clients that come in who just want a massage, no particular problem. They're not looking for a therapeutic intervention. But my preference is to work with people who are struggling with uh, chronic pain and looking for resolution. And then biodynamic cranial psychotherapy. So that's where I've spent the most time focusing uh, my training. Um, and there, again, work kind of the spectrum from somebody comes in with symptomatic concerns. Uh, maybe they have, you know, tennis elbow. So we, I'll use cranial sacral to treat that or to uh, something more like uh, PTSD, right? And again, my tendency and my practice and my own preference is to work more 
on kind of what I call the software side, there's my computer background coming out, than the hardware side. I like working more with how the mind and emotions are impacting the body than just with physical mechanical um, issues. So my primary practice is what I call noetic cranial sacral. And this is a combination of uh, biodynamic cranial sacral, which is a very specific kind of cranial sacral. Um, and then that's blended with my training in um, somato-emotional psychosomatic work or the, the psychodynamic work. Um, blending those together in a way that, that for me is how I address, you know, kind of body, mind, spirit, you know, those uh, different often categories they're looked at, but really I think we all know that it's just all one person with these different flavors. And for me, noetic cranial sacral is, is, gives me an interface to work with my clients on all of those levels in a very explicit way. So what I've done is I've taken my eight years of training in cranial sacral therapy. So I learned biomechanical cranial sacral first, and then I did a four-year training in biodynamic cranial sacral, followed by another two-year um, postgraduate training in biodynamic cranial sacral. And then uh, in the background of while I was doing those trainings, I, I did a six-year training in energy medicine and then 12 years, uh, and it's still going, in the psychodynamic transpersonal work. And those are what I pulled together into this package of what I call the noetic cranial sacral. So what I, my goal with the noetic cranial sacral therapy you know, is to, first and foremost, to try and help my clients have an experience of health. Right? I feel like this is one of the things that, that we're missing, is a cultural definition of health. Really, all we know is uh, disease or not disease. You know, when I'm teaching and I ask my students, give me a definition of health, they always give me something that's over against disease. It's defined by the absence of illness right, or pathology. So that's not very helpful. I, I was, you know, it's hard to get more of something if you don't know what the something is that you're trying to get. And so uh, my work with my clients initially, and I mean, always, but up front is to try and get them to have a, a direct, immediate experience of health so that they can start to gauge it in their own system and to know whether they're closer or further than they would like to be. Next is resourcing. In cranial sacral therapy, we talk about resourcing a great deal. And this is presuming that we have all kinds of inner resources and people do better when they're aware of what the, those are and they know how to connect with them. So again, it's a, it's a bit of a measure, but it's also a movement towards uh, treatment and something to do. Um, so the next is a, the sense of wholeness, um, is, a, is a part of the work that I do. Somebody might come in that has absolutely no complaints, whatever. They have no health issues, no concerns in that regard at all, but they're just doing personal work and they, they just want to mature as a human being. They want to become more of who they are. And for me, that's, that's the way I, uh, you know, I'd express it in the form of they're moving towards um, wholeness and well-being. Um, and again, as part of that cultivating health, that attitude of just wanting to have more of the good stuff as opposed to being focused on having less of the bad stuff. And then one of the things that I find, and, and I'm sure most practitioners um, find this fairly obvious, is how uh, uh, dissociated people are from their bodies. You know, they kind of walk around like a mind in a vehicle and the body is, is just something that they maintain, but that's uh, often the, the depth of the relationship with it. So helping people to actually get in touch with and realize that the body is a part of who they are and that, and that it's, a, it's, it's not different than, it's not separate from, uh, it is absolutely continuous with. And then the same for their emotions. Uh, again, people to varying degrees are dissociated from uh, sometimes whole sets of emotions, right? Where somebody will say, well, I never get angry, right? And I hear that one often, very often, right? So that's a problem, right? Of course, because they have the ability to get angry, and if they don't know that they are, then this is leading nowhere good. So helping people get in touch with their emotion, building the infrastructure to be able to move that emotional energy in a way that's helpful for their life. Same with the mind, you know, so you can have people who live their whole day, you know, whole week kind of in their mind, again, dissociated from the body, or vice versa. People who are very 
kind of rooted in the body, but they don't give much attention to their mind. So to integrate the mind back into the self-sense. And then essence. This is the one, I think, for a number of reasons, uh, people have the least amount of contact with, is their essence. And the uh, noetic cranial sacral, again, is, has as a goal to help people get in contact with that in a very definite, palpable way that it doesn't seem mysterious, etheric, otherworldly, silly, but it's just, oh, that, that part of me. Often when people experience it, they'll be, it'll have a sense of familiarity. I didn't know that that had a name. I didn't know that that was something I could have more of. Um, but that's the goal of the work, is to help people kind of weave all of those layers of their self together so they can live, you know, moment to moment as a whole integrated uh, being. So the clients, uh, you know, that I have come in to see me, you know, they're, they're, it'll range from people who are just looking to relax. Um, they have no specific need, or at least they don't know when they walk in the door that they have any particular deficit. They're just coming for a massage. They want to relax. Uh, more often uh, in my practice, I see people that are coming in because they have chronic pain. Often they've gone through the system. The system hasn't worked for them. That's why <coughs> they've ended up with me is uh, um, because They've gone through, the, they've seen the doctor, they've seen the physical therapist, they've probably seen the chiropractor, and now they've come you know, all the way to the massage therapist. And again, that's the client base that I like to work with. Uh, next, probably most common for me, is um, the people that are having um, emotional uh, pain. Whether that's just momentary um, grief because of the loss of a loved one, or it's trauma from an accident, um, and then the uh, last clients that I look for are the folks who um, are just looking to cultivate health. You know, they've, they've come to some understanding that there is this thing called health. They can have more or less of it, and they want to spend time really investing in having more of it. Uh, and really, in many ways, kind of that's my ideal client, you know, uh, is that person who's come to that realization that they want to be healthy and they're ready to invest uh, their resources uh, in being healthier. So before I wrap up, I just want to open up if there's any questions um, about any of the things that I brought up. This would be a great time. No? Okay. Oh, question. yes. Can you describe cranial sacral? What that experience? <laughs> you know, I've seen it. Mm -hmm. just the light Sure. Um, so one of my favorite questions that I just dread getting, you know, descri describe cranial sacral therapy. Um, so I guess in a certain way I would say, you know, first and foremost, it's, it's, it's nothing like massage, right? There's no kneading, stroking, you know, kind of deep palpation. Um, it is, you know, classically described, it is light contact, no more than five grams of, of pressure, so roughly the weight of a nickel. Right. So very uh, light pressure, especially in the biodynamic world. Uh, biomechanical, sometimes they'll do things that are closer to uh, like a chiropractic adjustment where there's actual physical forces. Mm -hmm. But in biodynamic, um, we consider even intention to be too strong. Right? So, so, the, 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 so it often leaves this question of, well, what's being done? <laughs> and the way I describe it is it's like going to see a, 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 a psychotherapist. You know, or a good friend, where you go and you just kind of tell your story. And, and in the act of telling your story, and, and, and maybe the, the friend asks interesting and provocative questions, it helps you tell the story better. That once you've told the story, you've kind of got it all outside of you. There's a sense of a space. And often in that space, an answer arises, you know, your own answer. That's the way we see biodynamic cranial sacral. As, a, as the practitioner, I'm just there to listen and listen and listen and let your system tell its whole story and uh, ask interesting questions, which we consider that's what the touch is. The, the, the touch of what we call interaction options um, is, is kind of giving the body a, a choice. Do you want to go this way? Do you want to go that way? But, but ever, ever, ever so gently. So um, that's more kind of theory. It doesn't necessarily, so it's a difficult question to answer um, in that 
I might spend 30 minutes of a session just lightly touching a client's ankles, and that's it. But I could be working with their shoulder, you know, the uh, interosseous membrane, you know, in the skull. I mean, there's there's all kinds of things that I could be working on, even though I'm just touching the ankles. So it's it's a tricky one. Okay. Yeah. And how do you know then what to touch or where? So you're, you're not actually dialoguing with the person. Um. Uh. Yes, I might be. I mean, there is a dialogical part to the to the treatment. Um, but there's also a nonverbal dialogue that's happening. And, and so in cranial sacral, there's what we call the inherent treatment plan, which is, again, their system will very clearly communicate, you know, what's up, what's needed, where, the order of progress of a session. Um, and, and it's generally palpable enough that the client can feel it just as well as I can. You know, I'll have the, you know, hands on ankles, and I'll go up to, you know, their right hip. And they'll, they'll say, you know, I hear this all the time, is, oh, I was so hoping you would go there. Uh, so there's this, this phenomena that arises in the field called the inherent treatment plan, and that's what we follow. Yeah. All right. Very good. Well, thank you. <laughs>